Wish TV. All Indiana politics is your premier source for Indiana politics. Focusing on issues that matter to you. I still want us to be the best in the Midwest. We can't afford another lockdown. Give the citizens of this country the relief they need. Education in the state of Indiana remains priority number one. In-depth nonpartisan coverage. We don't know exactly where the economy will be in January. People are worried with good reason. Exclusive interviews with Indiana's political leaders. We have the resources here in the state of Indiana to care for those who are in need. Expert analysis on critical legislation. We need to reform those laws. This recovery is going to take some time. We've got to anticipate that there'll be a budget shortfall. From Wish TV, this is All Indiana Politics Podcast on the All Indiana Podcast Network. Good morning and welcome to All Indiana Politics. I'm Garrett Bergquist and for Phil Sanchez, a historic visit to a war zone by Indiana's own governor. Eric Holcomb on Thursday became the first sitting governor of any state to visit Ukraine since Russia's full scale invasion of that country two and a half years ago. Holcomb met with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. You can see them here. He signed a memorandum of understanding on economic development, academic partnerships and cultural exchange. Holcomb also visited a memorial to fallen Ukrainian service members. He spent about a day in Kyiv. He spoke to Ukrainian as well as American reporters. So today the pen becomes just as important as the sword. And as we seek to restore peace and usher in prosperity and then maintain it, this will strengthen our bond even more. Тому сьогодні ручка стає такою ж важливою, як і меч. І ми дуже би хотіли допомогти у тому, щоб відбудувати мир, відбудувати заможність і потім сприяти одне одному в тому, щоб підтримувати тісні зв'язки. And so to my uh, fellow Hoosiers, my fellow community builders back home in Indiana and all across Ukraine, I say now is the time for construction. And I pray and will prepare uh, for a time soon for reconstruction and recovery. We understand the stakes that are involved and we believe in the rewards. So proud to stand with you. Let's get at this. Let's get to work. And Slava Ukraine. This has been an ongoing conversation about how we can help. Obviously, uh, we've been doing a lot of things leading up to this. When back in February of 2022, when Russia initially uh, invaded um, this sovereign nation, you'll recall that the state of Indiana took a number of steps, uh, including the legislature, myself as well, with an executive um, order to divest in. Um, Russian-backed investments. We also made it illegal for Russians to own property in the state of Indiana through the legislative process. So we've been doing a number of things. Businesses uh, on their own, obviously. Houses of worship have been involved here on the ground. We've um, Our universities and colleges have really stepped up in a big way, offering um, uh, scholar programs. Purdue had the first and the largest in the nation to this date. Um, scholars program. So there's been an ongoing evolution, um, but the appeal to have more of a, not just people to people, those cultural um, um, partnerships, but to have a government to government along with the business to business. That's what got us to formalizing this relationship through the memorandum of understanding, focusing on economic development two way in Indiana and in Ukraine, um, economic development, academic uh, exchanges, programming, uh, and then also uh, the cultural uh, initiatives that uh, we want to share. We're not pushing pause. And, and by the way, two-thirds of Ukraine is free and open. And walking around Kiev today, people are out getting ice cream and buying flowers and walking through the park. And uh, this, this country doesn't get to just check out. Um, um, and, and think about uh, the economy next year. Uh, life has to go on, and that requires partnerships, and that requires trusted um, allies working together, even in a time of war. Um, and so uh, what one state can do, 
I mean, tens of millions of dollars if you ask Eli Lilly and Corteva. They can help with crop production and seed rotation, et cetera. They can help with um, supplying through charitable means um, cancer medicine for children during the war uh, years, uh, diabetic medicine right now. And so we have, uh, that's why I mentioned earlier, our houses of worship, et cetera, so many people are doing so many things on their own. This MOU is about encouraging more of that to the benefit, again, of both. Well, that, of course, will be up to them. It won't, it won't be on my watch. Um, these are constructive. These are productive. Um, these are things that we are doing in other countries all over the world. I've made it no secret to say um, Indiana is an internationally connected state. You need not look further than your own hometown to see those um, tentacles and that reach that uh, Indiana has all over the world. And so that's what we're doing right now, right here. Um, and we don't want to waste another moment. As for other considerations that governors will have to make, we have to make them every day. We make them in Kenya, we make them in Slovakia, we make them in the Middle East, um, we make them on the southern border, where we send our men and women to wear the uniform in the Indiana National Guard. Uh, those will be decisions that will uh, have to be made by the next commander in chief of the Indiana National Guard. But as for this MOU, that doesn't contemplate that. We're talking about economic academic and cultural initiatives and really ramp them up. Coming up, another Hoosier politician visits another international conflict zone. Congressman Jim Banks joins us to discuss his visit to Israel next. Welcome back. About 100 hostages, including roughly half a dozen Americans, are still in the hands of Hamas. This as we pass 11 months since the deadly October 7th attacks on Israel and the beginning of the war in Gaza. Congressman Jim Banks recently returned from a visit to the Middle East. I asked him what new information he'd learned from Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. With us now is Congressman Jim Banks. Congressman, welcome back to the program. Good to be with you. So you visited Israel at the end of August. What did you see while you were there? Well, I spent a week in the Middle East. I started in Israel, met with uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu. Um, at that point, uh, there were fi still five uh, American hostages and several dozen hostages still being held by Hamas. By the end of the week uh, that I was in the Middle East, there were six hostages who were executed at point blank by Hamas, including an American citizen. So really, really a heartbreaking visit. Um, I went to learn more about the situation there. Of course, America stands with Israel and uh, we should be doing everything that we can to help Israel do what they have to do to protect themselves and to wipe out the terrorists and the bad guys who have attacked Israel and who are holding hostages and also do what we can to, to bring those hostages home. We still have American citizens who are being held hostage. So a, a very good meeting with the prime minister. Also met with uh, leaders in Jordan, the king of Jordan, the prime minister in Qatar, uh, the prime minister of Saudi Arabia, and the president of Egypt to talk about what the, the Muslim countries are doing to work with the United States of America and Israel to bring a ceasefire and to return the hostages. And overall, it was a very productive trip, but also gut-wrenching and heartbreaking while, while we were in the Middle East uh, to learn of the of the the killing of uh, six of the hostages, including Hirsch Goldberg, uh, whose family is from Chicago. They have ties to Indiana and Indiana University. And I had dinner with the with the parents of the hostages on Monday night after we met with Netanyahu. At that point, they thought their, they knew their son was still alive, but by the end of the week, he was killed. And it just goes to show what's truly at stake there and why we have to do so much more to back Israel up to do what they have to do to protect themselves and bring these hostages home. What are some things that Prime Minister Netanyahu said to you in his meeting with you? Well, I Israel uh, recognizes America as their most important and cherished ally, and America, too, uh, re at least 
most of us in Washington, D.C. recognize that Israel is the greatest ally that we have in the Middle East, if not in the world. Uh, the importance that Israel plays to bringing peace to the Middle East uh, is, is critical at a time like this. So October 7 was Israel's 9-11. Um, several people killed in Gaza, several Israelis, several Jews killed and taken hostage. And, you know, it, it brings back memories for me as a as a college student. When September 11th happened, it unified our country and uh, President George W. Bush at the time. Americans came together and we we sought justice. We went after the bad people, Osama bin Laden and others who uh, who brought uh, death to our doorstep and attacked America. And uh, in, in so many ways, October 7 in Israel is is uh, much like that. And it's, it's disheartening. By the time I got home just a couple of days ago uh, to hear Joe Biden and Kamala Harris blame Israel, not re completely dismissing the fact that Hamas attacked Israel, not the other way around. And in, in a time like this, we shouldn't be attacking Israel, being tough on Israel. We, sh we should be supporting Israel and being tough on the terrorist groups like Hamas, Hezbollah, the Houthis, the Ara Iranian ta uh, uh, proxy groups who are bringing uh, uh, evil to the world. We should be backing up Israel in their, in their uh, efforts to uh, bring justice and uh, take out the bad people and, and protect themselves. Based on your conversations with Prime Minister Netanyahu and his counterparts in Jordan and Saudi Arabia and Qatar, how much hope do you have for a ceasefire deal in the very near future? Yeah, I, I think that uh, a ceasefire, a resolution is um, even even Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, talked about the, the the hope and likelihood of that in the near future. But uh, Pre Prime Minister Netanyahu and Israel's goal is to is to stop Hamas um, in their tracks, to wipe out uh, the leadership of Hamas to prevent Hamas from doing something like uh, they did on October 7 ever again. And, uh, and America should support them in that. I support them in that as a member of Congress will continue to support Israel and have their back uh, uh, for a long time to come to help them to support them in what they need to do. According to the American Jewish Com uh, Committee, they still count seven Americans being held by Hamas, two of whom have been confirmed dead. What do you know about the conditions of the remaining Americans still held by Hamas? Well, I asked that question not just in Israel, but when, when we visited other countries who are involved, uh, we're helping to uh, mediate uh, on America's behalf and, and uh, in some cases, uh, with Israel involved about the safety of the hostages. And uh, we were assured that those hostages were safe. And yet days later, you, we, we received the tragic news of the six who were killed um, uh, late last week. So I, I, I don't take Hamas's word. Uh, Hamas is a terrorist group. Um, we shouldn't take their word for anything. They attacked Israel to begin with. They, they held um, Israelis and Americans hostage and there should be hell to pay for that. I mean, at the end of the day, that 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 that's the reality of it. We should we should be doing what it takes to bring justice to this situation and uh, to make sure that it never happens again. Right now, a big sticking point is whether Israel should control Gaza's border with Egypt. Now, Netanyahu insists that it should, but his own defense minister says it's not necessary. Should Netanyahu back down on that particular issue if it means bringing the hostages home? I think Netanyahu is right uh, to defend the border, to stop uh, Hamas from continuing to smuggle weapons into Gaza so that they can never do something like what they did on October 7 again. So I, 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 I spoke uh, directly with Prime Minister Netanyahu about the Philadelphia corridor, which is that border between Egypt and Gaza and Israel's interest in patrolling it and uh, controlling that border. Uh, to prevent permit uh, to prevent Hamas from digging tunnels and and uh, anything else that they've done in the past that led to what happened on October 7. So I think Netanyahu is completely right in the right on this. And, and uh, as far as I'm concerned, we should be backing him up on that part of the negotiation is it is one of the final pieces of the negotiation of the ceasefire to allow the allow Israel and the IDF, uh, their military to patrol that border. It makes all the sense in the world to me. Congressman Jim Banks, thank you for joining us. Coming up, Indiana's best political team on new sexual harassment allegations against more senior Hogsett administration officials.
Welcome back to All Indiana Politics as we welcome in two members of Indiana's best political team, Democrat Arielle Brandy and Republican Whitley Yates. We'll begin with the growing sexual harassment scandal surrounding Indianapolis Mayor Joe Hogsett's administration. The former head of the Department of Metropolitan Development now also faces accusations of sexual harassment and an employee of that agency was fired a few days ago for the same reason. Arielle, how likely is it that we learn of still more such cases in the coming days and weeks. I mean, since the last time we talked about this, it's grown, unfortunately, and I don't think that that's the end of it. I mean, when you have something like this that has festered inside of an administration has become the culture, I mean, we're more likely to see more people come out of this. I mean, what was just reported, there's about six people that are right now being investigated under his administration. I don't think it's over, and it's very unfortunate that we have gotten to this point for someone who's supposed to be leading our city with an administration that we can trust, and now we're here waiting for more stories to come out and more women to come forward. Whitley, City County Council Republicans have said depending on the results of an investigation, the mayor's resignation or removal should not be off the table. Could we see more outright calls for Hogsett to step down if this continues to grow? I think the fact that we haven't seen more calls for him to step down thus far is a little bit alarming specifically when it comes from those on the left. The fact that this is the party that purports to support women and to love women, but the rhetoric has not matched the results. And unfortunately, the only two um, Democrats that I've heard speak out have been Councilor Jesse Brown, as well as um, State Senator Ms. Hunley. And so I'm actually surprised not to see more speaking out about what's happening. I am happy that the Republican caucus has created this bipartisan committee to not only investigate how we got here, but to really discuss and talk about how we're going to move forward. Thank you to the two courageous women who stepped out and who spoke up about their treatment and the toxic culture, because now I believe they are blazing trails for others to feel safe and comfortable to tell their story. Now, Indianapolis Mayor Joe Hogsett has begun to answer some reporters' questions about his handling of the original sexual harassment allegations. Those were against his former chief of staff, Thomas Cook. He says he was not aware of the allegations that Cook had harassed employees during the period of 2018 to 2019. Whitley, do you buy that? Absolutely, I don't buy it. I think that this is his chief of staff, his number two, and types of conversations and types of people who are coming out against this behavior. And I'm not just talking about the ones we know about from the article. I'm talking about just the overwhelming sense of the volunteers from the campaign. Not even people who were specifically employed knew about Thomas's behavior and felt uncomfortable around him. And absolutely nothing was done until years later. I think Hawkset knew. I don't think he may have taken it as serious as he should have, and now this is the result. Ariel, I'll let you respond to some of that, but also Hogsett has ramped up sexual harassment prevention training and he launched an anonymous reporting portal. Will those actions solve the problem? I mean, I'm glad that we've gotten to that point, but it should have been something that was in place from the beginning. I mean, this is 2024 and we should already have these types of policies and procedures in place. I think right now it's a moment where we're seeing these women coming forward and unfortunately they're having to relive their stories publicly with the media. And right now, the only reason why I think a lot of these things are pushing forward with any policies are because these men are being outed for the bad behavior that they've allowed happen in the city, uh, the city's administration. And so for us to get to this point, it's for me not enough. I'm glad that we're here and we need to keep pushing forward. And I'm also very grateful for our two Democratic candidates, uh, Destiny Wells, who's running for attorney general, and Jennifer McCormick, who's running for governor, that have actually made this a priority for their own campaign campaigns and putting forth legislation and things that they want to make a part of our government to help end this type of cycle of sexual assault and abuse in the workplace. I got about a minute left. I want to briefly address Governor Holcomb's visit to Ukraine. Uh, Whitley Holcomb increasingly at odds with fellow Republicans over support for Ukraine. Uh, is there a possibility that a future Republican governor might rescind that memorandum of understanding that he signed? 
think that our visit to Ukraine, as when he goes abroad in many different places, just shows that Indiana is not just a state in the Midwest, but we have international reach and we're going to be building relationships and business, not only here in America, but abroad. I think it should be looked at as a strong sense of leadership, not only here, but other places where business. Whitney, I've got about 15 seconds left. Ariel, do you think other states should follow Indiana's lead on this? I do. I think at this point in time, when you have a governor who's stepping up and wanting to kind of make those relationships and put people first and put Indiana on the map, that makes it even better for us. Other states should be looking at All right, the work. We'll, that have, to, we'll have to leave it there. Ladies, thanks for coming in. We will be right back. Thank you for joining us for All Indiana Politics. We'll be back here next Sunday morning at 930. And be sure to tune in this Tuesday at 9 p.m. for our ABC News presidential debate simulcast on Wish TV. Have a great rest of your weekend. From Wish TV, this is All Indiana Politics podcast on the All Indiana Podcast Network. Watch All Indiana Politics live Sunday mornings at 930 on Wish TV and at wishtv.com. Subscribe to this podcast and listen weekly here on the All Indiana Podcast Network. And be sure to discover even more great podcasts at allindianapodcastnetwork.com.